So that is a perfect segue, which I want you to continue <laughs> with because you're talking about consolidation of the market. And some have said there has been no greater influence on consolidation than 340B. So no. first I get... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're gonna, I, I want you to start off that piece of the conversation, and, and it's really talking about how a piece of legislation, you know, and, and maybe it is the piece of legislation that has, or if in your belief, or maybe hasn't, had the greatest impact on really changing the dynamics of the industry. Well, I mean, certainly in the oncology setting, 340B is leading to, to the consolidation of oncology providers around hospitals. I mean, there's consolidation happening across the provider segments for a variety of other reasons, um, many of which, many of those reasons are also impacting oncology, but I think the biggest driver is probably 340B. Look, this is a classic example of a, a government program of good, born of good intentions gone awry. This was originally conceived of as a program to help 90 um, hospitals that serve disadvantaged patients, and now it's, it's uh, been embraced by upwards of about 1,700, I think 1,700 hospitals nationally. And effectively what hospitals are doing is, I think, exploiting the program to try to just generate additional revenue and subsidize their operations off of what they, these discounts that they get off of drugs by buying them at a forced discount from the manufacturers and in billing payers like Aetna or Medicare at the full rate. So after a statement like that, do you want us to pixelate your... Your face from here on out. <laughs> I've, said this, oh, I've <laughs> said this before. I've said this before. I'm already done on this issue. Um, look, it, it, it's it's a problem because it's driving patients into the hospital to receive onco oncology care. That could be an appropriate setting for certain patients, but it's not an, a, the best setting for every patient. It's higher cost to the payers. It's higher cost to the system for sure. For certain patients, it's going to be far less convenient. It's going to be lower quality for certain patients. Um, and it's not being driven by what's best for the patients, it's being driven by this sort of perverse economic incentive that's been built into the market as a result of 340B. And it's also driving oncologists to sell their practices to the hospital. For every oncology practice that the hospital acquires, they get about a million dollars in additional revenue. Um, the Affordable Care Act expanded this. Um, some guidance that the administration put out recently in the last five years led to additional um, gaming, if you will, of this system. And I think that the reality is, and I'll close on this, a program that was meant to service hospitals that really did have very diverse missions and really did service a lot of underprivileged patients has been exploited by hospitals that don't necessarily have the same mission. And, and if I was looking at that, I'd be worried about preserving this for the hospitals that really need it and be worried about the hospitals that are exploiting it um, that there will be a political backlash that will put at risk the program for the hospitals that really need it. So, so Ted, um, we know this is an area that you have some strong feelings on, but it sounds like Scott did a really good job of enumerating all of them. Did he, he miss he, anything? He did, He <laughs> did, but he actually he gro grossly underestimated the, the figure. Here's the, here's the stats. If you think of an oncologist, depending on what he or she treats in terms of diseases and therefore drugs use, let's say on average they account for $4 million worth of drugs. We're talking about a program now that gives upwards of 50% discounts. That's 100% margins. So that equates to anywhere from a million to $2 million per oncologist. So you take an oncology practice of 10 oncologists and you multiply that by one or two, you're talking about 10 or $20 million and it falls right to the bottom line. And you know, here's the problem with it, and I get misquoted on this all the time, that 340B is a critical access program, not just back in 1992 when it was created, but now. If you look at Ryan White clinics, you look at hemophilia clinics, right. you look at community health centers, if they did not have access to 340B, they would literally dry up tomorrow. It would be a national catastrophe. The, the interesting thing is that those entities are held to requirements that, allow, that require them in terms of transparency and accountability of where the dollars are going. So the other element, and, and that's what Scott touched upon, is the huge growth in 340B is not those clinics, it's in DISH hospitals, disproportionate share hospitals. And the problem there is if you look at it's gone crazy, and when did it start? It started in 2005, which was the first year the Medicare Modernization Act, which changed Part B reimbursement, was, was started. And there were consultants running around the country saying how much money you can make off of this program. So what, what, what happened is this program has gone leaps and bounds, and it's on the dish hospital side. And here's the problem.